and welcome to the Facebook Live Cameron Peak Fire Update for today, Friday, October the 2nd, 2000, no, 2020. <laughs> My name is Lauren Maloney. I'm a public information officer with Northwest Team 6. I will be hosting and facilitating this meeting tonight. And the way that it's going to go is that we will, I have a couple of short announcements for you, and then we will hear from our incident commander, Sean Sheldon, and then we'll hear from our operations section chief, John Norton. Uh-oh. Sorry, John. John Norton Jensen. <laughs> okay. And then um, after that, we'll have a question and answer session where uh, John and Sean will be able to answer some questions. And then we'll close it up and I'll make sure to share some resources with you toward the end just to make sure that you have all the best pathways to get current fire information on the Cameron Peak incident. So the first thing I want to tell you is that tonight the uh, Larimer County Sheriff's Office could not be with us. Uh, they they uh, will be back with us uh, next week on Monday. However, if you do have specific questions about evacuations, you can contact the Joint Information Center. That phone number is 970-980. 2500 and I think we're also going to get that phone number pasted into Facebook so that you can easily look at that and call it. So uh, that's one thing I want to let you know. Also, uh, Poudre Valley Electric shared an update with us. They're also going to be attending on Monday night and we'll be able to share progress at, at that time. But I, I do want to share the update that they provided today. So stand by, I'm going to read that to you. All right, so uh, Poudre Valley REA crews have made good progress today, energizing all of Boy Scout Ranch Road from, our man from their Manhattan substation along to 68C to 74E. And there may be services along this road that were not energized due to fire damage. Uh, repairs will begin on Monday along the Highway 14 corridor from Rustic to the Fish Hatchery on Monday. This will require roughly four miles of line to be rebuilt, equating to approximately 80 poles. Work continues to finish the last two miles of the main line that runs along 63E and feeds Pingree Park. Monument Gulch itself requires extensive rebuilding and engineers are in the process of completing the line design. There's not an exact timeline on all the repairs, but Putter Valley REA has brought in extra contractors to expedite the restoration to safely restore power as quickly as possible. Putter Valley REA members are encouraged to sign up for text or email alerts when the power is restored by downloading their app. And we're gonna paste the link to that app download into the Facebook chat. They also note that updates can also be found at their website at www.pvrea.coop.coop and we'll be pasting that link into Facebook too. So those are some good resources for you to get some information on the power net tonight and through the weekend and then Monday we'll be able to get an update and share more on that. So there's another note that I want to share with you uh, relating to credentialing. So the uh, because of the demand for access into the mandatory evacuation areas associated with the Cameron Peak Fire, Larimer County Emergency Operations Center will offer credentialing again tomorrow, Saturday, October the 3rd, from 8 a.m. to noon at the Fort Collins City Hall. The address for that is 300 LaPorte Avenue. Or you could call 970-732 3036 or email them at oem at larimer.org at least 15 minutes prior to arriving so that they have time to arrange for your credentials to be ready in a timely manner when you arrive and you can find this information on the larimer.org link camera uh, camera and peak fire on insulin too so um, just one more thought that I want to share before I invite Incident Commander Sean Sheldon up here. Uh, many of you have reached out and asked about where to offer donations. So I just want to let you know that you can contact the local Red Cross. You can also contact your local fire department. 
Uh, you can help your community and folks that are evacuated from their homes or have lost their homes due to the Cameron Peak Fire by connecting with those two resources, the local Red Cross organization and your local fire department. That They're gonna be best able to receive donations or donated cash and put it into good use to benefit folks from the Cameron Peak Fire. So with that, we'll move on and I'll invite Incident Commander Sean Sheldon to offer some comments. All right, good evening folks and thanks for attending um, this uh, virtual meeting. Um, we're glad that you could take time out of your busy day to uh, join us and hopefully get some answers to your questions. Um, so um, John's gonna come up here in a little bit and talk about uh, what we've been doing the last couple days and how things are going on the incident. But I will tell you that things are going relatively well. Um, we've been uh, out there, um, crews, engines equipment have been making really good progress on the on the tasks that we're asking them them to do uh, one thing that you may all need to know is that you know this isn't just a daytime operation uh, we're working on this incident uh, 24 hours a day uh, currently the incident's over 125,000 acres and there's 866 people assigned to this incident and we're at about 34% containment, so making some good progress. Um, I do wanna kinda go over some weather. Um, our incident meteorologist, uh, today's their last day and they're currently transitioning with a new uh, meteorologist so they couldn't be here. Um, as you know, with weather forecasts, um, they are uh, quick to change. Um, and then the meeting that we had uh, two days ago, I indicated that uh, the weather was gonna be stable um, for uh, about four to five days. And that was kind of true, um, other than the fact that we did get some red flag warnings, which are warnings that uh, indicate uh, some critical fire weather that we had. That, those occurred today, and that critical fire weather was for strong winds, and for uh, low um, relative humidity, so drier air and, and stronger winds. Uh, the forecasts that we're seeing um, currently for tomorrow are some reduced temperatures. So temperatures in the low 50s to the upper mid 60s um, and uh, kind of uh, winds that are variable, um, not real strong, nine to 10 miles an hour with gusts to 13. So, uh, tomorrow is going to be a good firefighting day for us. Sunday, things are going to start drying out. Um, but then on Monday, uh, we have another wind event that's going to be uh, a critical wind day for us uh, with some relatively high winds. Um, not as strong as what we had um, a week ago at the 60 mile range but uh, we could see winds in the 25 to 30 mile an hour gusts, which is gonna be critical uh, for us uh, on that Monday time frame. Uh, and then we're gonna see low RHs. Uh, after Monday, uh, the winds are gonna start dying off a little bit. They're still gonna be relatively strong, just not as strong as Monday. Uh, but what we're really gonna see as a trend, and, and you've seen it most of the summer, is dry dry conditions and uh, at night we're not going to see that uh, moisture coming in so uh, we're going to continue with dry what we call poor humidity recovery over the night so the fuels are just going to stay dry out there um, which is going to be problematic for folks it's just going to take longer to mop things up and so forth so um, just to know that that's coming um, the firefighters are going to keep working hard um, there is some good things with wind um, and, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, that good thing is that it does test the work that has been done out there. And so that is good. The bad thing is if the work isn't being done great or there's something out there that we didn't see outside of our lines, the ability for that to get up and, and go um, is, is gonna be increased. So that's just a, just a heads up for folks. Um, and I'm sure you're going to have questions that uh, will relate back to this tonight, and uh, I'll be happy to answer those. So with that, um, we'll look forward to uh, hearing what John has to say and then answer your questions tonight. Thanks. 
Thank you, Sean. So now we're going to introduce John Norton Jenkins for an operational update. Please repeat your name. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is John Norton Jensen. I'm operations trainee for the Northwest Team 6. Uh, good evening all the Cameron Peak Fire followers. We appreciate your interest. I will give a brief on what happened today and what we're going to try to do tomorrow. Alrighty. Due to the weather and the smoke, uh, firefighters on the ground working with our rural fire departments, Larimer County folks, and all our partners at the state DFPC had a really good day. So a uh, very productive day. Up here in the north end of the fire, kind of one of our priority areas. Uh, we did a real good job of uh, using heavy machinery, progressing west to east towards this 333 Alpha Road. and started bringing in water and firefighters on the ground to cut down snags and start really working the heat on this north perimeter in this section. In the Kilpecker Radio Tower area, uh, heavy machinery went both east and west, followed by firefighters on the ground making very good progression out here towards the uh, northwest part of the fire. And by heavy machinery, I mean bulldozers, feller bunchers, skidders, uh, machines that cut trees down called hot saws. We got a, a large amount of heavy equipment working in this area of the fire and are, we're putting all our available resources to this priority along with some other priorities as well. So lots of uh, good work done there today, lots of productive work. Along the Highway 14 corridor by the fish hatchery in Knicknick, we uh, further used some aviation to uh, cool down Sheep Creek and they'll mop up, stir, you know, work fire around homes that we uh, that we burned out around previously. So we, we lit some fire around these homes that we've prepped to allow that to remove fuel around these homes. Now we're mopping it up with water. So we're putting water on the fire, we're using hand tools, chainsaws, in some cases some heavy equipment but trying to keep in mind we're going to be easy on the resource of private property as possible in highway 14 corridor we patrolled of engines check sprinklers check porta tanks checked all the uh, equipment we use for structure protection uh, up here in division romeo uh, structure group north which is in charge of uh, resources on the north end plus division romeo uh, patrolled all the areas in here that had roads where houses were impacted by the fire that had black around them or adjacent to the fire. So again, we're hitting hot spots, we're stirring up heat, we're checking on houses inside the black and adjacent to the black. In between the two fingers, kind of west of Elkhorn here, they're furtherly uh, continuing to burn very slowly to remove some green islands to button up this piece. We still have a large interior island of unburned fuel. We don't, we don't want that to come out. So we're, we're burning in here, securing around some houses, mopping up, going nice and slow. Okay, down in the Tango Uniform Country in Pangree Park, I've been told I was saying it wrong, my apologies. Down in Pangree Park, we continue to use aviation assets to cool heat above Comanche res Reservoir. So that'd be helicopters of buckets or snorkels. We've been successful in there to this point. We, were, we had some, uh, some good progress there. The fire is, we're trying to check it as it works its way downhill out of the Comanche wilderness towards the reservoir. We also opened up some roads a little bit better into the reservoirs to allow our firefighters to get in and out pretty quick. There's a trail system above the reservoir we're looking at to use as well to uh, help us keep the fire north of Comanche Reservoir. Uh, forces are in Pangree Park as well. Firefighters rehearsed their structure protection plans, went over the, all the items and the equipment they need for that to make sure they're ready for this point protection objective. Okay, down in the park in Whiskey Zulu, we had some good work done uh, preparing some historic cabins. We call it structure protection. We use uh, sprinklers. We use uh, basically looks like aluminum foil. We call it shelter wrap. We wrapped the house in shelter wrap and put some sprinklers around a historic cabin in the park. We also cut access on the Grand Ditch Road that had some trees down on it to make sure our firefighters can go from Division uh, Whiskey Zulu, or the park, into the really southwest part of the forest here in the Long Draw Corral Creek area. And uh, 
the Corral Creek area here in Division Alpha. They had some great success today as well, uh, burning out an anchor point and really trying to hit this heat up my uh, pointer's pointing at right now. Trying to secure this heat and using an existing trail system and, and some firefighters on the ground to put some check line in using some natural features. By natural features, I mean like uh, Cash Corral Creek, some rocks, whatever it might be to prevent fire spread. Okay, over in Division Alpha, well, Division Alpha's here, my bad. Division Delta was uh, checking lines, making sure heat across the lines was dealt with. And the plan for tomorrow is more of the same. So priorities for aviation assets or helicopters will, will be on the north end, cooling down the line to allow firefighters on the ground to get in there with water and chainsaws and help out the heavy machinery work in the east and west and Division Foxtrot and Lima. We have aviation going to be used here in the Sheep Creek area to check the fire for growth. We'll have some aviation being used here above Comanche Reservoir to check fire growth working its way towards Comanche Reservoir. More than likely, we'll use some aviation down here in Long Draw to kind of check that fire spread as well. We have a good forecast today, tomorrow, from what the IC was passing on. I expect to have some good results tomorrow as well, and we appreciate your interest. Thank you. Thank you, John Norton Jensen. Now, I'm gonna invite our incident commander, Sean Sheldon, back up here to answer a few questions that have been coming in on Facebook. So the first question is, could someone talk briefly about how this fire is part of the overall picture of the fires in the US, the resources available, and how they all interact. Okay, so great question. So uh, nationally, we have uh, what's called preparedness levels, and it's one through five, with one being the lowest, which means there's tons of resources, not a lot of activity going on, up to level five, which means resources are scarce, and there's a bunch of fires going on across the nation. Um, currently, we just lowered from a five down to a four um, and then the uh, region that we that this fire is in actually moved up a little bit so right now we have northern california is in the top uh, priority spot um, and they're still at a preparedness level of five um, southern california is in the second level spot and they're at a preparedness level of five and then we bumped up to the third level um, and we're at a preparedness level of three. Um, and then there's various other regions are at level three all the way down to some that are still uh, at level two. So what that has done is it has actually freed up some resources uh, that were going to some of the other regions. Uh, we are getting a few resources in now, um, but what's happening is resources that we have had on the incident are starting to time out and I know that's going to be probably one of the other questions um, but I'll hit on that so typically teams and resources whatever they may be would get uh, deployed for uh, a 14-day time period um, with uh, conditions the way they were this year and the high preparedness level of, of four and five uh, a lot of times we ask those resources to extend. And so there's two ways that they could extend. One is we could just keep them going for another seven days. So you would get a 21 day assignment and then you need to have two days off uh, during that time frame. Or we could extend folks to 30 days with having a day off in there as well. And so a lot of the resources that were here when our team got here had already done the extension to a 21 and some had gone to the 30 day uh, role. Um, incident management teams were doing the same way. So that's kind of where we are. Um, that's how the, the teams go. That's how the resources go. Um, and that's where we are kind of uh, right now as far as the overall picture um, across the, the nation right now with regards to fire. Thank you, Sean. So the next question is, are you going to request Air National Guard MAF support, M-A-A-F-S support? So we don't actually request uh, that particular item. 
we request retardant to be dropped. And then the, the region that we're working in, whether it's the geographical area, um, the national coordinating system, will send that resource to you. So whatever's available, we don't actually pick and choose what type of uh, uh, aircraft we, would, we want um, or, or that type. Um, other than helicopters, um, we do get a, a request those and hopefully get those. So as far as the MAFS uh, retardant platforms, we just order up retardant and we get what comes. Right now there's uh, uh, plenty of the ones available, um, so we shouldn't have any issues uh, getting that if the conditions allow us to be able to fly fixed wings and, and drop retardant on, on these incidents. Thank you, Sean. Next question. How much of the 125,000 acres are no longer burning? And are there areas that were burned earlier on that have no active fires now or are still smoldering? So that's kind of a hard question to answer because uh, we don't really look at what percentage of the area is not burning. We look at what is contained. So um, I can't give you a good number on that, but I can tell you the areas where you see the black lines um, those areas are looking really good and that's you know we put the black lines on there when we are, are pretty confident that the, that we've met some of our mop-up uh, standards or mop-up turn back standards um, and those standards change throughout the uh, area on the fire and it's based on the slope the fuels um, how the fire burnt when it started and the work that the firefighters did and so we try to get those areas to the point that uh, we've um, uh, removed any ignition sources uh, for a distance that we're positive that the fire is not going to jump out of those those areas. Uh, we use other tools. Um, you'll hear the term cold trail. Um, what is that? That means you take your gloves off, you use your bare hand, you fill the dirt uh, for any hot spots, and then you put those out. So we'll use that. We also use um, the uh, um, infrared from flights, whether it be from the fixed wing flights that all of you could look at uh, through some of the sites that are out there. Um, and we also use some um, IR platforms, infrared platforms in helicopters uh, to help find some of these sites. And then when we really want to get uh, down into the nitty gritty, especially around houses and around some areas that uh, we may not go back into frequently because of the the terrain that it's in we use handheld uh, um, infrared devices to really get uh, uh, to the those small things and and really pinpoint the, the, those hot spots out there so the firefighters could go put those out and they won't uh, come back and be issues to us later hopefully that answered that thank question you. thank you Sean how do you determine if an area is controlled or contained when it is totally inaccessible so that that's a good question and a lot of times that that may not happen um, that may be where weather um, deals with it um, but then it also goes back to we'll use those aer aerial platforms whether it be um, a fixed wing uh, infrared plane to uh, look at those areas or we use uh, the rotorcraft a helicopter fly low over those areas to um, um, look at those areas. It's just uh, not feasible nor safe for, for firefighters to go in some of that area. Um, there's no uh, safety zones, no escape routes. If somebody got hurt, it would be really hard to get them out. So there are areas on this fire that um, are gonna be really hard for us to really ground truth. Um, and, and so we'll be using those aerial devices to help us make some really good decisions to pass on to the agencies that we work with and for. Okay, thanks for your patience. Oh, 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 I'm gonna ask you one more question. Thanking you, but I'm gonna give you one more question right now and we'll call you back up here in a couple of minutes. Folks are wondering about the proximity to the Mullen fire and how both teams are addressing that. Okay, so um, for folks that are, are familiar with NCWeb, you could you could just Google NCWeb and pull that up, and you could zoom in to Colorado, and both those fires will pop up, and you could see how far they are apart. I did with a program that uh, 
that we have uh, within our agency was able to uh, draw a line, just a straight line from uh, the Cameron Peak fire to the Mullen fire. Um, and they're about 25 miles apart in a straight line. Um, so uh, I think we're looking really good right now. Um, operations has, uh, has been having some conversations with the operations on, on their, that fire. And so they're talking about uh, what they're doing, uh, what type of things we might start doing um, if that fire does start progressing uh, this direction. Thank you, Sean. We appreciate your patience with all the questions. So I'm just going to take a moment here and recap where we've been tonight. I know we're, we're getting on to 8 o'clock here. It's about 5 till, so I just want to remind you that so we have, uh, we've identified that the sheriff from Larimer County is going to be joining us on Monday evening and can cover a number of evacuation questions for us then. We also have the Poudre Valley Fire, uh, Poudre Valley Electrical Co Cooperative uh, coming on Monday night for our virtual public meeting at that time. So, oh, maybe this will help with the fog. <laughs> Who's tired of foggy glasses? So, um, we'll, we'll have some visitors here on Monday evening who can dress uh, can address some of these specific questions that are rolling in and so then um, we've had an uh, overview comments from incident commander sean sheldon and we've had an uh, operational briefing here from john norton jen oh boy jensen sorry john and uh, so what we're going to do is now take some questions for john that are operationally focused and and i think what we're going to do is there's there's some very very specific you know, how's my house kind of questions. And they're a little bit hard to answer here in this virtual setting. We'll take a look at some of those tonight and we'll see if John can focus in in his operational briefing on Facebook tomorrow morning on a couple of areas. We'll see how we can address those without um, standing here just driveway by driveway through the night. So thanks for that. And then um, I'll invite John up here and we'll hit him with some questions and uh, see how we go here. Come on up, John. I want to say something quick, too. Fair enough. Okay. So uh, I'm back. John Orton Jensen here. Uh, this map is available, or a map similar to it, on NCWeb. So a lot of folks on Facebook here are asking questions like, where is the fire compared to these communities? If you go on NCWeb, just Google MCWeb, you can get maps. You can figure out what's going on from there for sure. NCWeb is a great resource. I use it. The IC uses it. It's a fantastic tool to share information. So. And on the InsaWeb is a story map and there's interactive tabs there and you literally can punch in your address and see where your address relates to the fire so there's a little bit more specific information from InsaWeb that john has highlighted here okay so you ready yes ma'am do you know what happened to the westlake camera Westlake camera, yeah. I'll, I'll find out and get back to you no, on that I, one. I think we can figure that out here too. And I saw some links there in Facebook scrolling by. So um, I'm gonna continue on through the questions here. Um, folks are wondering about Highway 14 between Glen Echo West to Arrowhead. So there's been fire all along and they're just wondering if there's anything more that you wanna offer past what you shared with us earlier. No, the, 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 main, the main meat and potatoes here is kind of by the fish hatchery. That's where most of the activity is. And everything inside the black, they're patrolling, they're working, they're making sure those, those houses are secure, making sure those houses have all the heat worked around them. And in, out in front of the fire, out here on Highway 14, we're out, we're working houses, we're doing structure assessments, we're setting up pumps, putting up porta tanks, and uh, we're doing structure preparation. Okay, thank you, John. Yes, ma'am. Trying to stay away from the super specific ones. Are you seeing any significant hot spots along the uncontained perimeter between the fingers there? Yep. So between the fingers, as we're there on, uh, if you go online and look at uh, heat maps, you can tell there's some heat there, and that's because we're we are putting that heat on the ground. So uh, we are doing a small burnout operation to remove green fuel in this area here for sure. So this is uh, being worked on by a one of our better crews and we have some engines there to support them to doing that as well I, can i ask you i'm asking a quick question too so uh i saw a really good question about the smoke 
And uh, somebody down in Estes Park asked if the smoke was off our fire today. That's a good question. It is, and I was about to ask that question so, uh, next. So yes, ma'am. So the bigger picture here, we have a we have a fire on the Arapaho Roosevelt National Forest on the southwest wind called Williams Fort. Then we have one north of us called Mullen, which is on the Medicine Bow uh, Route National Forest. The smoke you saw today was dominantly off the Mullen fire, which is about, I don't know, 20 to 30 miles northwest of us. So that smoke that made its way down to Estes Park, we, we were putting up some smoke today too. I mean, it's a, we got a big fire here, but the, the talking to our air specialists here assigned to the team, most of that smoke was getting blown in from a fire to the north of us called the Mullen fire. So we're one of three fires right now that are impacting the Colorado air shed. Thank you, John. Okay, I've got one more question. Let's see if your answer is any different than mine. They want to know how big is a building wrap? A building wrap? Okay, so uh, good question. So when uh, I go to a house that needs structure protection, based on the size of the house and the threat, there's different tools we can do to uh, prepare that house for a wildfire that's approaching it. So uh, engine crews and hand crews will uh, remove fuel around the house. Say you had a wood pile next to your house. Say you had uh, a whole bunch of small trees going right up next to your house. Working with our partners with Larimer County and the local volunteer fire departments, we'll, we will uh, remove those fuels from next to the house and add things, add something called shelter wrap in certain situations, not all situations. And uh, some houses which are really remote or uh, won't have a, aren't a safe place for firefighters to hang out once the fire passes, We'll use, it, it basically looks like aluminum foil. It's a super heavy duty aluminum foil, which we wrap around the house, just like a baked potato getting aluminum foil around it. So we wrap the whole house. We make sure that all the areas in the house which can receive embers like gutters and, and heat traps and underneath porches, that they're covered and we can prevent that ember spread into the house. We also use sprinklers in certain situations. We'll set up sprinklers around the perimeter of the house with the pump and hose and a little porta tank full of water that will spray the house down but all this structure preparation we have a limited amount of supplies so we have to triage the homes which are the most threatened we will prepare the most the homes which are the least threatened we prepare the least and the homes out in the middle and the out in far reaches where we don't feel comfortable sticking people because of the fuels and the bad escape route or because there's too much trees around the property We'll a lot of times put shelter wrap around a, on a house. It's really common on historic structures that belong to the Forest Service or the Park Service, like a lookout tower or a, or a homestead that's out kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So that's more of a common tactic we use in that situation. Thank you, John. A much more full and complete answer than I would have shared. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes, we are. Okay. I think we'll let you sit back down and we're okay. going to invite Sean back up here. I get it. I'm sure they'd rather hear John than me. But. <laughs> well, uh, let's see here. What plans are being taken to protect us on the Mullen fire side? So what plans are being uh, taken to protect us on the Mullen fire side? Um, so there's a team in place up there um, and they have a bunch of resources. They actually have more resources than what we have on this incident. Um, they have pretty close to a thousand resources. I think this morning it was like 960, 970, what I heard. Um, and so they're going pretty aggressive up there as far as their tactics. And they've uh, put as many of their resources as they can on the south end. So they're doing what they can on their end. We're still fighting fire on our uh, incident. Um, and that's what our main focus is. But we are, as we're starting to uh, get more resources in, mainly equipment, we are, um, and this is probably a better um, conversation with operations, but there are some roads um, that uh, we're looking at to the north of these communities that we're starting to go in and, and look at and assess and start doing some, some preparation work on those so that we're, we're building another box farther out um, so that uh, if uh, the fire to the north were to come south we have something in place already um, and if not uh, that that thing that we're working on those uh, those lines will be there for future use as well 
Um, because we know fires are going to happen again in the future and if we have these in place it's just going to make it faster and easier for the resources that are trying to protect your home into the future thank you sean there's one more question relating to cameron peak and the mullen fire folks want to know uh at what point could it be considered a complex could you address that please so typically um you only consider fires a complex when they start in a group um, it's really uh, problematic when you take fires that start in different areas um, under different uh, uh, ownership or different jurisdictions and then you combine them. It's a, just a financial nightmare. So we typically don't do that. Um, what could happen down the road if they get closer is at some point maybe one team could manage both fires, um, but they are still a far fair uh, distance apart. So that makes it kind of hard to uh, plan and to uh, do all the work that you need to do as an incident management team or to uh, give all the firefighters the, the items that they need in a timely manner and for them to be successful in, in doing the work that they do. So um, these fires will more than likely stay separate uh, incidents. Um, as you know, this fire is under investigation. Um, I don't know about the Mullen fire, but as long as they uh, could be started by different means, you, you never want to com complex them. You want to keep them separate uh, incidents. Um, so hopefully that answered your question on that. Thank you, Sean. We appreciate it. I think we'll invite John back up here to answer just maybe one more question. Yep. <laughs> So John, um, we've had some folks ask just to quickly cover, recap what's happening in Rocky Mountain National Park again. Can you just give an update on the fire there? Sure thing. So we had that, the fire went pretty big there back beginning of September when it pushed down into the park. There's only been really two active places of heat. The one about right here to W is the upper part of Cash Creek there. One over here in Long Draw and Corral Creek. Corral Creek. So we have, uh, I'll talk to the mic, sorry. We'll have, we've inserted more and more firefighters into this area around Long Draw. The whole plan is to try to corral the fire with Corral Creek and using natural features to kind of herd it away from the park and prevent further spread if possible into the park uh, just from what we got going on now, we, we don't want the fire spreading a whole lot more. It's a big fire. We have limited amount of resources and we want to make sure we, when we have an opportunity to put a piece of the fire in check, we will. Okay, a little bit of a piece of heat in Cash Creek. We have people on lookouts watching it and assessing the need for bucket drops of a helicopter. So that is the, the primary uh, tactic Cash Creek is using aviation assets right now. The primary tactic over here in Long Draw is using ground forces and aviation assets. This due to it being a more of a, a larger source of heat. You know, a little bit, a little bit more going on here in Long Draw. The park as a whole has a, a very good fire management staff. We have uh, lots of items in place we call management action points. And what's that mean? It means based on the fires growth we do certain things so x happens we do y so right now x is happening x has happened in this area we're providing the amount of resources we can afford down in this part of the park to secure that heat we have people in place to make sure they can watch that fire progression uh, any kind of uh, smoke production we'll have an idea what's going on we're flying it on a daily basis our field operations Vince Grace is flying out on a daily basis with his uh, subordinates. So we're, we're keeping, uh, this is very important to us. We're keeping an eye on it. We have a division supervisor assigned on, on the park itself and one right next to the park. So these are gentlemen and gentlewomen that are, their whole job is to run a section of the fire. So the, what's a division? A division is a, a geographical area on a fire or a group of, a group of something. So like structure group north covers the north. You know, Division Alpha covers a section of the fire. So we have two divisions covering that part of the fire. 
with resources assigned to them that we can allocate for that for that priority. So uh, we do have a plan in place. We have alternative and contingency plans in place, and we're closely working with the uh, park superintendent and the fire management officer at Rocky Mountain National Park. And we're we're talking to the Estes Park emergency manager and police folks on a daily basis as well. Thank you. Thank you, John. Great update. That will conclude the questions we're going to ask John tonight. Thank you. Okay. So uh, at some point I wandered up here with my mask still on and I had a couple of folks uh, admire my Smokey Bear mask. So uh, a couple of things about that. I just took one of those uh, handkerchiefs, actually a friend took one of those handkerchiefs and cut it up and made it a custom mask as a part of support for fire season something that you folks can do at home too. So thank you for that. Uh, Smokey Bear, of course, is a long-standing wildfire prevention uh, mascot. And um, that brings up an important point. I've noticed on Facebook that a number of you are very concerned about sharing fire prevention messages. I've seen uh, people concerned about uh, folks hitting trailheads and when the parking lot's full, uh, cars are pulling over in dry grass and um, it's an important reminder that hot catalytic converters and undercarriage of the car can spark a wildfire in dry grass. And so uh, thanks for bringing up Smokey. That is one key thing is Smokey is about fire prevention. And if there is anything that we can do together in this community to help prevent any additional wildfires on the landscape, it's very important that we do it. So I know that there are uh, lit fire restrictions in place, lots of closure areas, but be checking vehicles before you get them, get in them, make sure that tow chains are not dragging. Anything that can create a spark can lead to a wildfire. It is dry here, it is warm here. Uh, we expect winds over the next couple of weeks and it's, it's really important to just minimize the new fires, no, to eliminate the new fires on the landscape. So those of you who are fans of Smokey Bear, thank you, that's great. I want you to help share Smokey Bear's prevention message that only you can prevent wildfires. One other thing, folks have asked about John's pointer. It's a great pointer. You can make this at home. You can head to your local hardware store, pick up a piece of dowel, and then uh, use some uh, cardboard and, or other material, draw yourself an arrow, cut it out, paint it your favorite color, and you too, pointed maps with fine precision. I, there were some folks who are home studying, who, who have students at home, that maybe this could be a good tool. So just sharing that resource with you. And with that, I'm gonna invite our incident commander, Sean Sheldon, up here to close this thing out for us tonight. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, one more thing. I just wanna remind you again, that in addition to these virtual public meetings on Monday, Wednesday, Friday night, we're also posting regular operations updates on our Facebook page with John each morning. He comes in and points at the map with the pointer and goes around and gives good detailed updates. Uh, we're also posting periodic updates throughout the day with smoke reports and uh, anything new happening with the fire. Uh, we do keep that up on Facebook. We post on InsaWeb with our daily updates. Uh, on InsaWeb, we mentioned earlier, you can link to the story map for this fire. There's great tabs in there that really share the story of this fire and you can get some of that personalized address information. And uh, the videos with John are also posted on YouTube. And of course, you can always call us at the fire information line. You can find that number on InsaWeb. And then of course, we have public information officers that are posting at various locations out in the community. So there's a lot of avenues to get information about the Cameron Peak Fire. And we really appreciate you checking into that and letting us know where we can uh, share more information. So with that then, I will invite Incident Commander Sean Sheldon up here. Thank you. All right, again, just want to thank you all for attending this uh, virtual live meeting. Um, and then also, you know, I've been seeing some questions about how you could support the firefighters. Um, so our team and the firefighters are, are here for you guys. Um, they're here to 
uh, do what they can to protect the resource, protect your homes, protect property, um, protect those values at risk. And, and they do a great job at it. And they're fully supported. They, they get uh, meals, food, snacks, a place to sleep, showers, all those items. So what they really love to see though are those thank you firefighter signs. So um, while you're uh, getting your supplies to make your arrow and your smoky mask, uh, get some stuff to make those signs because that's what really uh, keeps those firefighters motivated is seeing seeing the thank yous that you guys give to them. It's it's very much appreciated. Um, another question I know folks are asking um, is when can we get back into our homes? And and you know folks are working really hard to try to make that happen, um, but we got a few a couple more days, and we got that one test day on Monday, and so we. We definitely want to get through that day and see how we're, do, we're doing. We're evaluating uh, options to get folks back in. We've cleared some areas already, um, but uh, I, I just ask for a little bit more patience. Um, it, it'll happen. We'll get you guys back into your homes, um, but there's still a little bit of work we got to do before we feel comfortable making that recommendation to the sheriff. Um, so again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, do want to say that uh, tomorrow, uh, if you want more information, John will be giving another update tomorrow. So uh, check that out, uh, tune into that. Um, he'll be providing the latest and greatest information uh, until our next meeting uh, that we have. So uh, think about questions you want to ask, post those whenever um, our PIOs are keeping track of those uh, questions and we'll get those answers to you as soon as we can. So thanks, have a great night, and we'll uh, talk to you guys later. Thanks.